Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome to our second edition of our Black History Town Hall series. And as I look around this virtual room, I'm so glad to see this august uh, panel tonight. Boy, I'm telling you, we're, going, we're in for a good one tonight. And we thank the Lord for what he is doing uh, at Sharon Bible and what he's doing during this Black History Month. Tonight, 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 we're going to be looking at Jesus and therapy. Yes, Jesus and therapy. And we're going to be dealing with that overarching theme uh, and discussion about the black family, how we were raised, some of the idiosyncrasies that we have growing up, and also talk about the taboo of having therapy, what they say sitting on the couch, laying on the couch. Is that necessary for even the Christian? Is Jesus enough? Boy, it's going to be great tonight, and I'm so glad to uh, just turn it loose. We're going to have prayer, and then I'm going to turn it loose to our facilitator, our moderator for the evening. He kind of looks like me. But uh, that would be in the person of Matthew Kirk. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight and we bless you, honor you for what you are doing in our lives. And God, we pray tonight that you would open up the doors, that you would give us greater understanding and clarity as we talk about Jesus and therapy. God, we pray that someone would be blessed some will be helped, some will be healed in the name of Jesus. Bless these panelists who have come from far and wide. And God, we pray that they would speak wisdom as you have given it to them. Now, Lord, have your way tonight. We bless you in Jesus name. Amen and amen. It's my pleasure to turn this session over at this time to Matthew James Kirk, who will be your facilitator for the evening. God bless you. Hello, 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 everybody. Uh, so excited and frankly honored and quite humbled to be uh, with you all this evening. Uh, super excited about the discussion that we are going to have tonight. Uh, as Pastor said, my name is Matthew Kirk. Um, whenever people ask me to get background information about myself, I never really know what to say. I am... Uh, I hold a bachelor's degree in history from Wake Forest University and I have a master's degree in student affairs from uh, Clemson University. I currently work with uh, young high school students, uh, specifically males of color, and I help them illuminate pathways to college and expose them to the college environment so that they are clarifying what those decisions look like when they get to their senior year. Um, outside of what I do professionally, uh, mental health and conversations about mental health and holistic well-being and wellness are very, very important to me personally. And so I'm super excited and honored to help facilitate our dialogue tonight because really we're combining two things that are very, very important to me and have been uh, very strong uh, influences in my life. And that is Christ and therapy. And so super excited. Without further ado, I would love to introduce our different panelists. Before I do that, however, do want to talk a little bit about some ground rules and kind of set the scene because after we introduce the panelists, I just want us to be able to dive in. So the first thing I would say is tonight we might get into some subjects that could potentially be triggering. And what I mean by triggering is that something could be mentioned or something could be said that reminds you of some type of trauma that you have been through in your life. Trauma is not always just what happened in the war or that horrible car accident you were in. Trauma could be things you heard growing up from a parent or guardian. It could be a reminder of, um, something that happened at work or different situations like that. So I just want to put a blanket on the conversation of we're going to talk about some things that might incite some emotions in you. And that is okay. Um, I would offer that we're going to at the end, talk about some resources that can help you sort through some of the emotions that could have come up in this discussion. Or if you're wondering what next steps could for you personally could be like, we'll talk about resources at the end, but do want to put that disclaimer out there. The other thing that I would say is there's a cute little button at the bottom called 
question and answer. And even if you are on Facebook Live, I think that we have people watching the live who can take your questions and they'll bring them to us as well. If that is not the case, I'm so sorry that your questions ain't going to get answered, but I'm pretty sure that is the case. So please put your questions in there as well. But use the question and answer because if you have questions or thoughts that you want to get out there, we want to make sure we introduce those to the panelists as well. There is also a chat or for our intents and pur purposes, I'm going to call it the amen corner. If something is said and you are like amen to that, it resonates with you, put it in the chat. We want to see it. We want to know that we're in the right direction, that you agree, all of that jazz. So having said that, um, I'm now going to introduce it to the panelists. Uh, panelists, I just ask that you remember all the things that we talked about before. Um, and I will also say, please try to keep all of our responses uh, pretty succinct. Um, I'm not going to give you a time limit. Um, maybe I should keep it at about two, three minutes a person, um, but try to keep it as succinct as you possibly can. OK, so without further ado, I'm going to let Robin Parks introduce herself and then I'll just start calling out names as we go around because Zoom can be confusing like that. Good evening, everybody. I am also blessed and very humbled to have this opportunity. Christ and therapy, my passions. Christ, my passion growing up, therapy, my passion as I evolved in life, and I'm glad to merge the two. I've been doing therapy for approximately 10 years. I'm now a licensed clinical professional counselor. I started out with substance abuse primarily, but understanding very quickly that mental health and substance use and trauma and all of that um, kind of uh, co-occurs sometimes. So I'm just very grateful to be in this field of work now, especially with more black and brown people are um, having the conversation about therapy and we're um, trying to reduce some of that stigma. Um, I'm just happy again to be in the field and I am running a private practice now. I started out in community, um, criminal justice population. And even though I'm still very, very much in, in touch with the community and criminal justice population. I am now more focused on trauma-informed care and mental health and just um, pushing the holistic wellness of our people, not discriminating against anyone else, but definitely, definitely have a heart for my people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. We will move to Brianna Dance. Hey, everyone. My name is Brianna Dance, and I am a licensed uh, social worker in the Washington DC area. I have been doing social work since 2015. And so I'm passionate about this topic and I'm honored also to be here um, to just dive into like Jesus and therapy and how that's impacted me and how I kind of help youth in the DC um, just live holistic and better lives all around. I'm really big on holistic self-care and Matthew said that Earlier on, it's not just one, this or that, um, it's a whole. So mentally, physically, spiritually, how are you doing? What does your soul look like? So I'm really passionate and uh, glad to be here with amazing guests. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being with us, Brianna. We will move to Michael Robinson. Thank you for um, the invite to be a part of this tonight. I'm so happy to be a part of this great panel. Uh, my background, I have a master's degree in Christian counseling from Philadelphia Biblical University, now Karen University. And I do premarital and married couples counseling. And I do it from a uh, Christian uh, perspective. Um, other than that, I am an administrator at Temple University. Um, I help uh, people in the Philadelphia area find employment. I'm director of the Community Outreach and Hiring Initiative for the university. I'm also senior pastor of Greater Enon Missionary Baptist Church, an urban ministry in North Philadelphia. I'm a columnist for a local newspaper here in Philly, Scoop USA Media. And that's about it. I'm not quite sure you can say everything you just said and then end with that's about it because that is amazing. Thank you so much for being <laughs> with us, Michael. And then we will end with Ashley Harris. Well, hello everyone. I am Ashley Harris. Um, as it relates to mental, I am a pastor, a preacher, 
Um, that is what God has called me to do. I feel like that's what I've been doing since birth is preaching to people. Um, as it relates to the marketplace, my experience has been working with human service um, in different capacities as it relates to case coordination, as it relates to working with families, as it relates to working with children and adults um, who've received government assistance, um, but more recently shifting into working honestly with organizations as it relates to program managers to work and also training. Um, so seeing um, a totality of our people in the DMV area in many different ways as it relates to education and also as it relates to social work, as it relates to the man, um, my passion definitely, this topic is definitely my passion. Understanding and seeing the blending of the interpersonal self. Um, a lot of times we grow up in church and we have overly spiritualized things um, and it's caused us, even in the black church, not to really know who we are. Um, and so with that, I have begun to feel a pull and a shift into life coaching, um, business coaching, helping people discover who they are, what are their gifts, what are their talents, and being able to own that in confidence and being able to stand and confidently fulfill what God has called them to do. So that is who I am. Well, I feel like I am virtually surrounded by some very, very, very accomplished people who are doing their fields. So I hope you all put on your hard hats and you are ready to dig into the topic. We're going to jump right into it. So we have talked and we realized that kind of looking at research, looking at uh, study, mental health counseling is stigmatized in the black community. Mental health and, mental health and counseling is also stigmatized in the Christian community. And so when we particularly look at the black church, and by the way, for those of you who aren't sure, stigmatized basically means that there is a great disapproval or a strong negative connotation that comes along with uh, mental health in these two different communities. So when we talk about intersecting identities, you're a Christian and your race, ethnicity, black, them intersecting in the black church, it's almost like double negativity is often associated with mental health and mental health care, and particularly with counseling or therapy. So in your work in the field, how have you seen this play out? What are some of the trends that you've been noticing? Anybody can start. So we know that um, overall, not just in the church, but in a broad context, um, there is a stigma, a stigma with getting mental health support in the African-American community. We know from back in the day, I'm 60 years old, and from back in the day when we had family members that were suffering from various uh, mental health, whether it was anxieties or other deeper types of uh, mental health issues, sometimes we just said, you know, I'll leave, you know, boo-boo alone. You know, y'all know boo-boo crazy. And they would just, you know, brush it off like that and really not take the, you know, situation seriously and, and not get that um, parent, son, daughter, aunt, um, whoever, that mental health support that they needed. It was just kind of brushed off. And then what we see is that when people do get it, oh, you crazy, oh, you, you know, and, and, and you hear comments like that, that make it even more difficult. You're actually creating greater barriers to people getting the help that they need because of those kinds of things that are you know, lo lobbed at them, those type of comments. And so people don't get the help. It, it's funny that when we get sick, you know, physically, we'll run to the doctor. It's funny that we'll grab the aspirin, we'll go to the drugstore and get whatever medication we need to ease the physical pain. But yet when we're suffering mentally and when we have emotional breakdown, we are so reluctant about getting that kind of support and help we need in comparison to the mainstream population. Matter of fact, to the mainstream population, it's kind of a, a badge of, of prestige to have a therapist on hand to give you the type of support and help you need. And we have to get you know, to that point in our, our community that if we're emotionally broke, that it is okay to move forward and get some type of counseling. Um, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong. And as we go on, we can, you know, cite some examples in the Bible of people who had some emotional and mental breakdown that really needed some help. What I found um, of late um, 
is that I'm getting a lot of younger individuals who are coming in, kind of disparaged with the church, um, definitely offering their background um, tied to the church and then something traumatic happened. And when going to a family member, that family member really not being sure of how to handle it. So what we normally do as black and brown people who have been part of the church, we rely on what we know to do, which is let's pray. And I think there's a disconnect more importantly about just being educated about mental health in general. And I know that when I went to school and I was being trained and reading the textbooks and, and you know being prepared to do the work, it resonated in me much, much more because I realized that this idea of psychology and mental health was born out of a white man's construct. And so a lot of even the moldals and techno techniques that I learned, I've been able to proudly say, because I work in private practice, I've taken those techniques, but I've been able to, to um, alter it in a way that I still keep the fidelity of the work, but I still meet the need of the person in front of me who's saying, I have church hurt. These are the people that I've grown up with. I was singing in the choir. Mama such and such was rocking me on her lap, but then something happened to me. And when I went to the church and I said I needed this, I was, I was met with, oh, just pray about it. And I think in all sincerity, we mean well when we say that because we don't know any other resource immediately. But then what happens to the individual who found it hard enough to even ask for help, then that individual walks away with nothing more and then closes off and isolates and so on and so forth. So I feel like because I'm a Christian um, and because I have some autonomy in my private practice, I'm able to blend the two together. And that way we can speak freely about their faith, their spirituality, however they want to categorize it. Because the other thing in training is we're told as professionals, don't bring up spirituality, don't bring up religion, you know, when you're in the session, allow the, the, the client to do it. But sometimes they don't even know how to really say it because they've been so ostracized. They already feel battered and bruised. They already feel like when I said this, this, you know, this wasn't accepted. So sometimes, you know, I'll feel it out. I'll use my best judgment. But I think it's a, a lot about educating. And, you know, it, it falls short in that area. We have a misunderstanding of what mental health really is. And it's not a, and it's and they're not exclusive to one another. Um, they, they, they have a connection. Absolutely. To, uh, to jump into this conversation, I think on my side of things uh, of pastoring and preaching, um, I agree with what my colleagues are saying. And from the other perspective, I think in the church, we are suffering with a more basic um, depreciation of understanding. And I think that a lot has, has a lot to do with one community, um, conversation, right? Um, sometimes our needs is really more basic, um, not just beyond counseling. Before we can even get people to digest counseling, we have to, from the pulpit, get them to digest talking to their neighbor. Right. You know, um, and tell the truth. Right. How you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. We know how to put on a, a good mask. We know how to say the right church lingo, but we're not used to real transparency and authenticity in the church um, from the pulpit to the door. And you see the trend. You see pastors falling behind closed doors to sexual sin. You see pastors who need to sit down because are killing themselves. Right. Because we have overly spiritualized real issues and real problems and not found the true balance of what real spirituality is. And, and understanding Jesus as a counselor, the Holy Spirit as a counselor, the word as a counselor, um, and its role in counseling and helping the, the person bring a balance to their emotional well-being, their spiritual well-being, and the total person, right? And so I think that in the church, we're suffering from a more basic need right? um, of accountability, of conversation, of opening up and taking that first step. Out. And there could be so many different reasons. I mean, one that Robin hit on is a lot of church hurt, right? But I think a lot of the perpetuation of church hurt is because we don't understand the culture, right, of being transparent and telling the truth about what we really are. We have used to, we have gotten so much in a seat of duality unintentionally i would say this unintentionally but there's a lot of duality and hypocrisy that goes on that we have trained ourselves for right and we have to untrain and unlearn ourselves to come back to a space of real transparency of this is where i really am this is what i'm really struggling with this is what i'm really dealing with and how do i begin to go seek out the steps for having to, for help for that from the pulpit to the door Right. It can't just be we can't tax even as ministers and as pastors, we can't tax the people just to run to the counselors anymore. Right. We have to be if we're going to lead the sheep 
and tend to the sheep, we got to tend to the sheep, right? To everything that's going on with our life, with their lives. It's not good enough just to preach wonderful sermons anymore. And the sheep are bleeding in, the, in between the, um, the pews, right? We have to know how to mend the wounds, right? And have the, te- the technicality and also the skill set and the education to begin to guide them. And if we are stuck, knowing where to refer, where to reach out so that they get the proper and total healing to be who God has called them to be. Just FYI, everybody, I am that person on everybody's Zoom call who launches into something and they're muted or has two screens and can't find the mouse. FYI, that's going to happen a lot tonight. Be gracious. That's all I ask. So what I'm hearing everyone saying is that there is there's a couple things going on right now in the church. One, there's a lack of education about what mental health is, about how to uh, address mental health issues, how to talk about it, not just in church, but in your family, how to recognize when something might be mental health related that's happening. So there's a lack of education there. But then on top of the lack of education, there is also a lack of authenticity. So I can't bring my full self to church because, you know, as uh, Robin, you were saying, I might be condemned for bringing my full self to church. You know, the I think often we see church and a place where we can come to be healed, or a lot of people. Let me say it this way: people come to Christ to be healed and to may be made whole, but often when we get to church, sin is ranked, and there's some sin I can be honest about. But there's other sin that I can't talk about. And so one of the questions I want to ask you guys is how can we be authentic in church if the church is more equipped to condemn than they are to counsel? So how can we be more authentic in church? What are some thoughts about that? I think um, one of the ways that we can address that is to do what you're doing right now, Matthew, and what your father has set aside for Black History Month, holding forums like this, where church shouldn't just be an epicenter for prayer, worship, and, 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 and it should be about those things, prayer and worship. But it should also be a clearinghouse of information because back in the day, um, the church provided information on jobs in the community. The church provided information on development that was going on in the community. If there was some despair or some tragedy, um, maybe somebody's house burnt down. Information like that was shared through the church so that the community could rally together and help those families out in despair. The church needs to get back to its roots, the black church, to get back to its roots of being that epicenter of information sharing so that resources and information can be imparted to the community to to help the community. Um, Instead of just coming in and just providing, you know, a great worship service, and that's great, but we need to be more um, um, uh, information-minded in, in, in dealing with these kinds of pertinent issues that affect the quality of life of individuals. Because here's the reality. If I'm emotionally and mentally broken, I may not even want to come to church anymore. And depending on your size of church, I may get lost in the cracks where nobody even cares about my condition because I'm just a number. And I may be, you know, wallowing wallowing away in my home in mental anguish when there's help out there for me. But because I'm just praying and that's good and I'm just, you know, holding on till, till my change comes, your change comes by God using people as his hands and his feet and his eyes here on earth to help one another. Iron sharpens iron. But sometimes, you know, if we're not, you know, about being progressive and, and, and adjusting to the times that we're in and providing this kind of information and debunking and demystifying uh, these stigmas that surround certain hot topics, 
then it's just going to be the same old, same old, where people are going to wallow in their despair and not get the help they need. I want to I agree. contribute okay. to you. Oh. No, go ahead, Brianna. Oh, um, just bringing it to a narrow, uh, this very singular view for myself is like me as an individual, I, it starts with me. If I really want to see a change in the church or anywhere I go, it's like, okay, Brianna, let me, let me focus. I can only control me. So I've done a lot of work and I have not arrived. As we said, sanctification is ongoing until the Lord comes back. But um, focusing on, okay, me getting, dealing with my stuff and being authentic with myself. If I can't even sit with me, then there's some, there's some issues. And then I have to be willing to hear and willing to receive um, help. And I think that the more that as an individual, I saw myself in my scriptures and with my therapist and doing the work and allowing God to work on me over time, because it's not overnight. Um, then once I'm a little bit more healed, then I can go out back into the community and be on forums like this, like we all are here. So I think there's so much power as individuals that we have um, and a responsibility and ownership in taking ownership of our lives and decisions. So I definitely think that that can contribute to the body, the overall issues of a lack of authenticity. I agree with um, Brianna. Um, I do believe that there is personal ownership um, that we all have to take. Um, but even beyond that, we have to start with church leadership as well. Um, that the church, there is a structure that God gave for the church, right? Um, as it relates to the head of the church, um, our church leaders, our pastors, overseers, um, even to elders, to deacons, um, there these there's church leadership. And God has set them in place and there's a standard for the church for us to be authentic, right? For us to be transparent, for us to have honor and regard. And we are the ones who set the culture and the pace and the tone for the church. Um, as it relates, it, it is responsible of every member as well to contribute to the church because each member is a part of the body of that church, right? And so all the responsibility does not necessarily fall on leadership, but a, heavy, a little more heavy lean responds on leadership. Um, because it's a higher call. And so for us who have the call to leadership, it is not for us to sit in our spaces to look pretty, uh, to have prestige, um, to have honor, but it is to serve the people of God and to cultivate this type of atmosphere. Because the truth of the fact is, like, um, like you're saying, Matthew, the fact that we have to ask that question should let us know that something is all foundationally as it relates to what we are teaching and what we're doing in the church. Because at the heart of the gospel, Jesus said, I did not come into the world to condemn it, but to save it. Right. So we have a spirit of condemnation in our church. We are off kilter right from the heart of the gospel. We are off kilter of what Jesus came to do. Right. He came to save. He came to seek and save the lost. And so and we have gone and, and through our teaching and through the doctrine that we teach it. We have, as Mr. Michael said, we've strayed a lot away from the, the function and the purpose of the church. Right. To know, recognize that as the church, we hold the answer. We have the panacea for the epidemic of the world. Right. We have the word of God in our mouths and we become the light on the set on the heel. But yet we have modeled ourselves to so, look so much like the world. And the world itself is already divisive and flipped on its head. So why would you want to be like something that is flipped upside down, right? And so for us to come back, we need a, we're having identity crisis. That's what's wrong with us and the church. And when we come back and reclaim our rightful identity, come back and really from church leadership, right, begin to teach and preach the true gospel and honestly, in authenticity, begin to share this personally, me getting real and being personal, as I've been growing and preaching, God has been dealing with me about that. Like, I don't want you just preaching just a bunch of do doctrine. I need you to share the people how you got out, right? So there's gonna be days where I'm gonna have to tell, you gonna have to tell your job. You have to tell your mess, right? And you need to be able to stand before the people and say, this is where I was. This is what I did. These were the steps I took, right? And it takes that real authenticity, that real transparency. So that means you can't live behind closed doors. You can't have now stand up and preach and be living mess. You can't do that no more, right? If, we're gonna have, if you're going to really believe in the real power of God and this is going to be real, you have to give people a roadmap, right, to really follow. And it starts with you, right? It starts with you setting a tone. It starts with leadership being on one accord and setting that tone and being able to encourage the body to have that safe place for them to land. Excellent. That key word, safe place. And before you even said that, that's what I was going to say. In order to be authentic and transparent, you have to feel safe. You won't do it unless you feel safe. And it's, 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 it's good to, vent, like you said, look at leadership, 
But we have to look at ourselves because if we don't do the work introspectively and personally, then we can't bring ourselves to the atmosphere and demonstrate what authenticity looks like. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you tell people, be authentic, transparent. Now these are trending words. Everybody's saying, be authentic, be transparent. Do you really know what that is? If we're having identity crisis, you may think you're being authentic. You may think you're being transparent, but you're actually in a disassociative personality and you think you're being what you really are not. And you're not even authentic at all so it's, it's it's layered it's a lot of work but you have to feel safe and i think that initially starts with at least having these forums on a smaller scale but then also doing the change interpersonally and 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 having the interpersonal relationships with just your brother your friend your your sister your uncle whomever where you're demonstrating on this authenticity little bits at a time they get to see it then they go out and model it to their nucleus and it goes on from there but i definitely understand what ashley is saying if leadership is not going to demonstrate what that looks like for the body then who do we follow who do we mimic so i want to take this and i kind of want to so we had a great question in the chat and i want to ask that question but i want to add this to it i think that there are things that we say and we do in church that make great church but negatively impact people in church or can be triggering. I'll give an example. You know, when people come to church, they're not clapping. They look like they don't really want to be there. And, you know, good church is the Bible says that everything that has breath, praise the Lord, good breath, bad breath. You can sit and frown at me if you want to. Don't you know God's been good to you? And it makes great church and it gets people hyped. But if I'm suffering and struggling with depression, the fact that I got out of bed and made my way to the sanctuary, y'all don't even know what it took to get me in the place. And now I feel like I have to put on the face to look like I'm good and I'm happy or pastor might call me out or somebody else might say something about that. It makes good church, but it can negatively impact us, right? Or, you know, how do we talk about, yeah, I love the Lord, you know, I'm glad, but y'all, I have suicide ideation. I have suicidal thoughts. How do I talk about suicide in the church? You know, how do you talk about being in the LGBTQ community in the church? So many things that are frowned upon and they're ostracized, but it doesn't mean you love Jesus any less. And so the question in the chat was, how do we have those vulnerable conversations? How do we, how can we introduce these topics? How do we make it, like you said, Robin, a safe place? And I'll be very honest, when I hear safe place, every place isn't necessarily going to be safe, right? But at least how can we set an environment where my fear is not in being vulnerable? You know what I mean? Maybe I can't be safe, but I'm not afraid to be vulnerable because at least I feel like I'll get the support that I need without the condemnation. And I know that is a hard sticking point in the church because the Bible often makes it seem like you condemn. It's black and white, right? But then there are, is also evidence in the Bible of Jesus saying the greatest commandment is to love one another as yourselves and to love the Lord your God. And I don't think those two are mutually exclusive. So full circle, how do we have those conversations in the church? And I would love to hear just from your expertise, what are some practical things we could be doing in the church? And to bring it back to what you talked about in an individual level, leadership wise, community building, what are practical things we could be doing in the church so we are really building up the body so we can have these conversations and people can talk about the real things they're going through so that they can be healed and delivered? I think that's that's excellent, honestly. Like, um, starting with the worship experience, um, because some people are triggered when they just walk through the door. Um, and, and, and having been a worship leader, um, I understand that, right? Um, sometimes what we do in church really isn't for the people, it's for us. 
um, it's for our own ministry, our own glory, you know, or our own expectations. Sometimes we don't think that the anointing is moving unless we're in C sharp, A flat, um, until people are saying, say yes, rolling in the floor, crying, you know, unless we see something tangible, then it's hard for us to know that God is in a building and God is working on the heart, right? When that's really none of our business, right? What God is doing in somebody's heart has nothing to do about what I'm supposed to be doing in the worship experience. If I'm reading a scripture, if I'm praying, I'm supposed to do what God called me to do, but the, whatever's happening in someone's heart is between them and God, right? And then being a worship leader, this is something I had to learn. I had to grow in, right? Um, I, unfortunately, was there was days I was that worship leader. You don't love them. You just sitting here looking at me crazy and getting upset like, God, why are your people, you so good? Why are your people looking like this? Until I realized they're people. They are actually people, right, who have all manner of issues. And it wasn't until one Sunday, honestly, I had to share when I was leading worship. And I took my mind off of what I thought should have happened. And I really focused in as a worship leader on setting an atmosphere, right? And when I began to do that, and I opened my eyes and I saw how many people were actually tapped in. And God was saying, there it is. He says, by the time you, you finally got it, you got it, right? That your responsibility here is just set an atmosphere. I'll do the rest right? I don't need you to do anything, right? I need you to focus on setting an atmosphere, making it easy for people to get to me, right? And I'll, I'll touch the hearts, right? I would do that. I think if we simply put, one, get back in our lane, right? Focus on the things that God called us to do as it relates to ministry. And also remember, we're ministering to people, right? We need to put people, we need to put people back in the right place in our hearts, right? We have gotten into a culture that is so self-centered and self-pleasing that we are missing each other. We are preaching, we are praying, we are prophesying, and we are missing each other. Our gifts are on stage, our, our importance is on stage, and we are not loving each other from grace, um, not having mercy with each other. And this is what the, the whole half of the New Testament is spent with doctrine about teaching you how to love your neighbor, Right. Because in the church, it was full of Jews and Gentiles and people with different cultures and different backgrounds and they weren't getting along. Right. And so the problem with us, for even from the foundational aspect of the church, is about how to love your neighbor. Right. How to treat your neighbor. And so this is something that we struggle with. And we have to be honest about that. Right. And so I think from a basic standpoint, from a practical standpoint, we have to remember it's about people. Right. What we're preaching, what we're teaching, if I'm just sitting in the pew. Right. As a member, I'm still surrounded about people and I have to begin to have that in mind, especially being a worship experience. Uh, we've gotten so focused on setting an experience, you know, making sure people have an experience that has gotten so showtime that it's not authentic anymore. Honestly, we got smoke machines. We got lights. We got all kind of stuff. It is an experience, but it is not a service. Right? It is not an actual place where people can come and communicate. We got commercials in the church. We got all kinds of stuff, right? And so we have taken this aspect of true community out of it. And we made it an experience. And we wonder why we don't know how to relate to each other, right? So I think if we go back to the aspect of becoming one, yes, Christ-centered, but also people-centered. Christ tells you to focus on your neighbor, to love your neighbor, and to serve one another in love. And so if we start coming back to that mentality, we can meet each other in a better meeting place. I think the other important part about that, when people use the word love and love your neighbor and love Christ, there's been so much trauma throughout the fabric of all of our lives, history passed down that we, I think, individually don't know how to love ourselves. How can you be expected to love someone else if you don't even know how to love yourself yet? So it's like really when you're talking about practical ways, it's it's somewhat like with the depression and the anxiety and all of these other influences and variables that a lot of times before we get to a certain part of our lives, we didn't control a lot of the variables from molestation to rape to so on and so forth. We are little kids or if you're growing up in a household where this is just trauma around you, you don't know until you're in your mid 20s, sometimes in your mid 30s, that what happened to you flawed you. You don't even know that. And then you've developed this kind of way of surviving, right? You kind of get on this survival and defense mechanisms come out of everywhere. And you're learning how to just navigate through life, which means you have forgot how to love yourself because maybe you weren't taught it. Maybe something happened to you where you forgot it and lost it because you were just trying to get up and live from day to day to day. So until you understand that, oh, my goodness, you have the revelation and to be honest with yourself that something is not right. And especially if you're a Christian, because the one thing that I like to do when I when I when I merge the two is that we can still use the Bible and 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 and, and use 
references and examples of the Bible and point out love. But if you don't sit with the individual to get them to the point where they actually can verbalize that something just doesn't feel right with me. I don't like myself when I look in the mirror. I don't like myself when I, you know, when I think about things, I, I, I don't know why it makes me feel this way or that way. And I don't know why I treat others this way, but usually because, you know, the cliche is hurt people hurt people. So practically it's like getting people to a point, the safe place again, um, where you can just have dialogue. Like even when in our church, when we have cell groups, it at least provides an environment where people get a little bit more intimate. And one person is kind of along the, the path of healing than another, then, you know, for instance, Sister Brianna, you know what I mean? She can say something that resonates with me and I'm saying, wow, I've been struggling with that all this time, but she was bold enough to say it and vice versa. So it's through those communities and, 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 and um, providing encouragement and empathy, because if I know something happened to me, the easiest way for me to be show compassion and reflect it to others, at least say, at least say to myself, if I'm hurting because of things I've gone through, that individual may just be hurting too. And if everybody could just pause and consider the other for a moment, then there at least will be change in the atmosphere of compassion and empathy. And then a dialogue can start. Yeah, I want to I want to stick on stay on that, Robin, of the whole in order to love your neighbor, you have to love you like that's that prerequisite there. And I just feel like, you know, if we're not doing work on our. I really can't love you the way that Christ wants me to. And so to go back to Matthew's um, practical things that we could do is really get to know who we are, the good, the bad, the ugly, and um, become more self-aware. I think tone matters. I think um, timing matters. Learning to read the room matters. I had a professor say, um, you know, be like act the person you're about to talk about, act as if they're in the room or the group of people you're about to talk about. So it's like consider that there may be somebody in this room that may be sexually abused or there may be somebody in this room that may be in the LGBTQ community. And you're do you're talking that nasty about that person, you know, and it's like. I think as, as people in the church, we have to be more self-aware. We have to read the room. Um, we have to realize that we're not Jesus. <laughs> we're not Jesus, y'all. So we have to realize that, um, you know, some people are different and at different levels in their walk. And I believe that we also um, need to realize that, um, I, wrote, I wrote a list, y'all. Uh, we need to meet people where they are. We really need to like meet people where they are and um, just be more aware of our own stuff so that we don't project because sometimes you know we can project our own insecurities on people and um and and silence people with our own issues and so i think that it's important to really be just more aware overall so i really do want to kind of narrow in and drill in on, I think, one really good point that came out of this. The scripture that I used before we started was, love your neighbor as yourself. And as these wonderful panelists brought out, it's really hard to love your neighbor as yourself when you don't even like yourself, let alone love yourself. And we talk so much about the love that Christ has for us but I don't know how much we really talk in the church about the fact that people struggle with realizing or understanding how Christ could love them when they don't love them and they don't like them, you know? And so I think another practical thing that I'm thinking coming out of this is as a church, we need to do a better part of defining and really giving people applicable ways to learn to accept God's love for you personally. I think we talk a lot about how we have to love others, assuming people know how to love themselves. And not only that, Robin, you brought up an excellent point. And at some point, I do kind of want to talk about that too. But depending on how you were raised, how love was defined, how it was shown, how it was expressed, how it was talked about in your household dictates how you love others in your adulthood. 
I am a firm believer that as a child, you are gathering information that builds your worldview and how you view your world, how you interact with your world and all the people in your world is established in childhood. So if you experience trauma as a child or unhealthy behaviors, which are also called maladaptive behaviors, those maladaptive behaviors will grow and manifest in adulthood. I will give you an example. You might be asking yourself, why do I always date the same type of person, the same type of man, the same type of woman, and the same things keep happening in these relationships? What is wrong with me? Well, baby, I would offer that there may not be something wrong with you. It could be things that you watch as a child that as an adult have built preconceived notions about yourself, about your worth, about what you deserve. And so you are looking for what you saw your mother or your father look for or the opposite in other people. I hope that made sense, what I'm trying to say. And so bringing all of this together, what I hear you all saying is, and uh, Michael, you were saying this earlier too, it's not just enough to be preaching the word on Sunday. There are community building things and not just outside the church, in the church walls, community building things that we need to be doing regularly to help build up the body of Christ so that they can do all the things the pastor preached about in the sermon. And one of the things I want to bring up that got brought up in the chat that Nikki said, one of the things we do here at Sharon are our life groups. I think our life groups are great examples of how we can take smaller groups within the church and be more vulnerable and show more things. But I also think to Ashley's point, that takes leadership, organizing what life groups look like. How can we take the concept of a life group to the next level so that we are having more conversations around holistic wellness and that authenticity that we talked about before? Michael, I saw you unmute. Is there something you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I like what, I think it was um, Brianna that kind of alluded to earlier about self-assessing oneself uh, as it relates to, you know, being able to love one, love others as you love yourself, th th that implies there's some self-assessing that goes along with that. Um, Joseph Luff and Harry Ingram, psychologists, uh, they created this, this relational model called Jahari's Window. And Jahari's Window um, proposes that there's four dimensions uh, to how we relate to one another. And if we're going to relate to one another in a healthy way, we have to examine where we are at any point in time in one of those four uh, dimensional window panes. And those window panes include this public persona. And as a church, uh, I, I want to kind of set the, the groundwork. The church needs to address these things by having experts like a Brianna, a Robin, a Ashley, uh, those that bring with them a certain depth of expertise in areas of need. Um, Jesus, oftentimes in the New Testament, before he preached, he addressed personal needs of the people. Then he gave you word. He addressed the needs and then gave you word. Going back to Jahari's window, th these four window panes on how we relate. The church needs to be progressive, aggressive about addressing this. The first window pane of how we relate is a public side. We put on a good show. We put on a good face. This is the public persona that we don't mind people interacting with. That's the part of us that we don't mind you inspecting and engaging. The second window pane is known to others, but unknown to self. See, you may see some, self, some stuff in me that I don't recognize, but if you're silent and not telling me that you recognize a flaw, I may go on continuing in this flaw. There, there was a situation where there was a person that, that had a hygiene issue in my church and it was brought to my attention, but nobody wanted to talk to the person. 
And so as the pastoral leader, you know, I approached them in love and discussed it and, and it was done with. They took care of their hygiene issue. But my point being is how come, you know, I had to do that when you could have easily approached that person in love. But sometimes we brush that away and, and don't want to, you know, get into a confrontation and allow these these maladies to continue. So there's this window pane of known to others, but unknown to self. Tell me if I'm on the wrong pathway so I can correct myself. And then there's this window pane of hidden potential where I have the potential to do good, but maybe I need some expertise to help bring it out of me. And not just, you know, the pastor, maybe I need a, a, a licensed therapist. Maybe I need a Brianna, a Robin, or maybe I need a combination of a pastor, Ashley, and, and a Brianna or a Robin to help bring that out of me, the hidden potential. And then this last window pane is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we hardly deal with our maladies. It's the private side. It's the private window pane where we shove all of our shame, all of our faults, all of our insecurities, and we never deal with it. Unless you deal with those skeletons in your closets, unless you deal with those problems that go unresolved. And, and, and a good example of that is David. David knew that his son raped his, his daughter. Tamar was raped by her brother Amnon. And David turned a blind eye to that. And his son Absalom was peeping this and was like, Dad, you're not going to deal with that? And that family dysfunction, because David didn't want to intervene, caused his son to want to kill his own father. And his son killed his brother for raping his sister. But that's all because we want to turn a blind eye and not deal with some of the dysfunction in our life, some of the dysfunction in our family, and we turn a blind eye and it just festers and blows up. A lot of what we talk about with this love and transparency issue deals with self-assessment. And if I don't have the wherewithal to do a healthy self-assessment, then those that can see the maladies in my life going on Please be brave enough and loving enough to approach me so that I can get the help I need. That's 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 profound and wonderful. Um, from what you're saying, the things that resonate with me is our culture um, as a church, right? Church culture. Um, culture drives everything, right? It, it drives everything, right? It drives organization and drives so many different things, right? And as a church, I think that we have to take a severe look at our culture. Like as we're talking, talking about creating a safe place, everything we're talking about goes back to culture. Um, and our culture is um, so, it is so abrasive. It is so triggering. And it's the reason why we're not able to get to where we need to go. Um, and if we go back to look at the foundation of what church culture is and what, how a church is supposed to be healthily structured, it goes to a lot of things that Mr. Michael was talking about, right? You know, what Jesus did, right? Addressing the needs first, then giving the word, right? Um, the church structure and culture, same thing happening with the apostles hearing about an argument about who was left out at the food table. So what did they do? They raised up leaders, right, to make sure that the needs were met, right? We shouldn't step away from preaching the word, but we need to make sure that the needs are being met. A, a church culture that deals with all of the things that's on the table, right? And honestly, when we look at our culture as a church, we are suffering, right, at our culture. It is, it is very much individual. Right. It's very much focused on the self and hiding oneself. Right. And that is not the culture that was originally given to us. And we need to return back to a true sense of biblical culture of what we are and what it means to be established as a church. Um, and if we're going to flip this thing right back upside, upside, right, right side up, then we need to take a look at that. And there's ways in which God built the church to drive and to function. Right. Basic things like I think what we have also done, too, this is where I really want to go. We really have divorced Jesus in therapy, right? We've divorced therapeutic technique from church. And we think church and state, they don't, they don't agree. They don't go together. And it is not true. Um, it is not true. Just as Mr. Michael has already so eloquently demonstrated, 
the Bible is full of so many emotional, mental trauma and mental health that God's people have gone through, right? The Bible talks about Jesus in a praying in a garden. And the Bible says that he prayed so much that he was so stressed in prayer that sweat came like blood down from his face, right? Until he had to mat his will out to accomplish the will of God, right? And so this was, this was prayer, right? And he wasn't praying in a church, he was praying in a garden. But yet this was a, an intense mental health moment and spiritual moment, both crescendoing at the same time, right? And, but Jesus, knowing how to live an adjusted interper interpersonal life, knew how to handle both moments, right? And we don't know how to do that, right? We separate the two, right? Church is over here and, inter and my life is over here. And we don't have the blending of the two. As if God it does not care about emotions, we think God doesn't care about emotions. A lot of us think God don't love us. God don't care about us. God is ready, but just to burn us up and send us to hell. That's all we think about, right? That's all we hear from over our pulpits and what we walk away with. But there, there, there's such a separation of the aspects of mental health in the church and as if the Bible doesn't give us structure for that. Where does it give us structure for that? Discipleship, right? How can I get, how in the world can I have an assessment of my needs if there is no discipleship happening in the church? And we don't have, we don't, and we check our hearts, we don't really care about discipleship anymore, right? We want to be able to log in, get my word and leave. That's not church, right? That's not what the real church is. You attended a service, but that ain't the church, right? The church is a body of people, right? Coming together, not forsaking the assembly of themselves together and being of one heart and of one accord for the sake of Christ, right? And being able to be authentic and transparent. That's the church. And a lot of us have been calling it church and it ain't church. And that's why we so hurt, right? That's why we are so burdened and in pain because we've been calling it something that God has never intended it to be, right? And when we really go back to the structure that God raised up for true discipleship, right? Someone should be in your business, right? You should not be a lone wolf in the house of God. These are not godly things, right? These are not healthy things and not righteous things, right? We come to church. We don't say hi to nobody. We just come sit in our seat and then we leave. That's that's not, that's not health, right? That's not healthy. And so when we begin to challenge our culture and how we're doing things, whether it be from the church side and leadership side of how we're approaching people and on my, my responsibility of coming to sit in the pew, right? We all have a part to play in how we are going to change this culture, shift the culture and come back to a true founded culture that is anchored in the gospel, that is anchored in discipleship, that's an anchored in community, as Mr. Michael was saying, that God had originally set up for the church when he originally birthed the church. I think that cultural component is very, very important as it pertains to the church, as it pertains to black and brown people in the home, because part of that culture is the idea that what happens in the house stays in the house kind of mentality, right? So when you have that culture, which I'm sure was born out of just maybe a slave mentality, but we have to hush hush and keep everything to ourselves, but we, you know, we progress a lot since then, not where we should be, but we've progressed, but we've taken those same old answers, right? What happens in the house stays in the house, right? And then when we come to church, like you said, Ashley, it's separate. So we carrying all of our secrets. We're going into the house of worship where we're supposed to get our help, but we can't even tell nobody what we need help with because what happens in the house stays in the house, right? So then how do we get each other to feel comfortable and safe enough to start saying what it is that we need without being afraid of what we say, exposing, you don't want your mama and them to look bad. You don't want your granddaddy and them to look bad. But how do we get help if we can't say what it, we need to say? But that also goes back to the self-assessing, because then what also has happened is people have tried it. People go to the church. They confide in somebody. And what happens? That piece of information gets to the wrong ears, gets into the wrong um, atmosphere, and then it, it gets manipula manipulated and, 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 and perverted. And then no one wants to talk anymore, and that's where the church hurt comes from. So then you run from the church, because when you try to use the church for what Minister Ashley and everyone else is saying, for a safe place, someone took what it is that you wanted to bring and then perverted it and exploited it and shamed you. So a lot of times with the skill sets that we all have in the body, I'm a therapist, Brianna's a therapist. We all make up so many different things in the body. Similar to what Matthew said earlier, if you have an ailment, you run to the doctor. But it's even no problem to get up and have everybody pray at the altar with sister such and such and, and brother such and such got to go under uh, for operation. 
But nobody is talking about, oh, sister such and such just had a 72 hour hold because she had a mental health breakdown. Let's pray for that. We won't talk about that. So it, it, nothing can be off limits when someone says they have a need. And once we understand that we can't stigmatize anybody, then the church or the doors, the doors of the church will sincerely be open. Bring everything to the altar. How can one decide what other what problem is more important to share or to state out loud or needs prayer over than another? Well, you know, Robin, I would even say let's address one of the elephants in the room. Sometimes you go to church with your trauma. The person in your house who could be causing the trauma could be the person taking you to church. That could be the pastor. That could be the first lady. That could be a deacon. That could be an usher. Could be somebody on the choir. Could be the person, the loudest saying amen, shouting all over the place, passing out and speaking in tongues. But as soon as they get in that car, they're a whole different person. And so because a lot of what y'all have been talking about with that community, we aren't building this community in the church where we are talking about things. There are some people that are suffering and they're wondering why nobody sees it. Especially if they've been conditioned at home to feel powerless. They might be like, I went to church every Sunday and nobody saw the abuse that I was going through. They saw this, they saw that. People turned a blind eye. And again, it's perception. The reality might be people really didn't see it, but perception could be y'all saw it or here we go, God sees it. So does that mean God doesn't love me? And you have people who no longer want to go to church, are hurt by church, feel like I've been hurt by these church people who are supposed to be Christians. If that's what Christianity is about, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And so you have people who were raised in the church that now want nothing to do with the Lord because they feel like what they've experienced and the trauma that they have experienced at home and in church has been, no one has seen that. And now they don't want to have anything to do with it at all. And so I kind of want to address the biggest elephant in the room with that. And it's why isn't Jesus enough? Why can't I just, why hasn't prayer been enough? I've been praying about the same issue for the past 10, 20, five years. Why isn't it enough? I fasted. Why isn't that enough? I go to church every Sunday. I pay my tithes every Sunday. Why isn't that enough? Why isn't Jesus enough? Why do we need counseling to? We know that in the Bible, the, the word of God tells us, having done all that you can, stand. All right. And, and there are moments where we pray, nothing's changed. And we, we saw that with, you know, the man that approached uh, Jesus and said, look, I went to your apostles to have my child healed and they couldn't do it. And Jesus says, you know, some things, you know, take take more, you know, takes fasting and prayer to accomplish some, some works. And there are some times where we have to do all that we can, that God has given us uh, the wherewithal to do. And all that I can do is if I'm feeling mentally broken, if I prayed and I wanna go to get some help, get the help and do that. Just don't, you know, sit back in that malady and allow that malady to, to hurt you. It says having done all that you can, which suggests, yes, you're going to pray. Yes, you're going to fast. Yes, you're going to do all the things. You're going to go to the elders when there's a problem because it says if you're sick, bring the sick to the elders. You're going to go through all of that. You're going to do every single thing within your wherewithal to become whole again. And if that means going to the doctor, go to the doctor. Now, if after doing everything, the malady still stands, then just do what the Bible says. After done all that you can, just stand. 
Because in some cases, and there are going to be some cases where a problem is not going away. Paul prayed three times, Lord, get this problem out of my life. And God allowed whatever that problem was to stay in Paul's life. There are going to be some problems that we're not going to escape. But God gives us the power and the ability to handle it. Amen, somebody. It may not go away, but God gives us the wherewithal to handle the situation. If he allows it to stay in our life, then he's going to equip us to deal with it. So we got to do all that we can in the power and abilities and the wisdom that God has empowered us to have. We got to be wise and take advantage of every single resource to make ourselves whole. And, and if the problem still stands, then, then just allow the power of God at that point to, to help you manage this situation. Because some situations, there are some situations that aren't going away, but through the power of God, he equips you to deal with it. I hope it made sense. Yeah, it did. And I um I just love Jesus because what we have to do, and I don't I try to not say we because I can't speak for everyone, but what I have to do is stop putting Jesus in a box. He's so much bigger than what even we can imagine or think. And so what I love about when I read the Bible is that he uses whatever he chooses to get the help that we need. So when I think of Ruth and Naomi and I think of Aaron and Moses and all the people that God put in those people's lives to help execute the assignment or whatever he wanted or the will, or whatever he wanted to go forth, um, that's what he did. And so I truly believe just on even a personal level that Jesus can use a therapist and has used a therapist in my life to deal with the distorted thinking that I had from trauma from an absence of family, you know, and I, disclaimer, I was adopted when I was a child. So I struggled with the abandonment rejection stuff. Yes, Jesus is there and he's helping me in, in prayer and all of that. But there's some thinking that I had to kind of address that was clinical, that was about black and white thinking or uh, catastrophizing things and all this stuff all this clinical stuff that I'm saying, but really just, I needed um, other things and God uses people all the time um, along with his word to get um, us healed and to get us whole. I'm going to um, tag on to what Brianna said. Um, I agree, you know, wholeheartedly and to what Mr. Michael said. Um, I think um, the question of why isn't Jesus enough, I think really is speaks to our view and the perspective of Jesus and how he works. Um, I think that we're so focused. We have us. We have a Sunday experience of, of Jesus, but we don't know Jesus in, in in everyday living, right? We don't know how to walk with Jesus, right? And walking with Jesus tells me to go to a counselor, right? Walking with Jesus because Jesus is a wonderful counselor, right? Either the Holy Ghost is the Paraclete; He's the Helper, right? He's the one who's supposed to lead me and guide me into all truth. So that means that there are things you are thinking that is irrational thinking, that is not the truth. And the, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, whom you are filled with, is supposed to remind you of the truth. As a believer, you have a space in prayer called meditation, right? It's not for people who ain't saved or people in different religions. There's things you have called meditation, which is what? A rehearsal of a truth. A re or it's, it's supposed to be a chanting, a, a medit something you're constantly saying to rechange your mental construct so that you are focused on the right thought because the things that God say to me are foreign. They are not things that are true to my nature. So I have to rehearse them so that my mind knows that it needs to be renewed. Having a renewed mind, talking about our mental map, all these things are not estranged from the faith, right? But God raises up people who are after his own person as a wonderful counselor, he raises up other counselors to help you navigate through the tough roads, right? And so this is, we need to get, I, I thank God for the pandemic that he shut our churches down because frankly, I think he was tired of it, right? Um, because he wants us to understand, to experience him in a different way, right? We're so used to just meeting him in the sanctuary that the moment we, the doors of the church closed, many of us lost our power, we lost our peace, we lost our help, we lost our healing, and Jesus is right where you are. 
right? And and he did, and this is not a condemnation. This is actually a help, right? For you to learn how to access G- Jesus right in your home. Somebody needs to learn how to access Jesus in the place that they're traumatized, right? In your house, right? In those relationships, and Jesus will meet you there. And he, is, he uses, like Brianna said, people who are counselors who will help you navigate your mental map right, which should not necessarily always be separate from biblical truth or understanding, right? Biblical truth does not, does not mean I need to negate my mind in order to have faith. faith. My faith is informed through the word of God, and it tells me the way to think. It tells me how to handle my emotions. It tells me to, that I can emote, right? It gives me the permission of all those things. One of my favorite examples of this biblically is when Mary and Martha's um, brother died, Lazarus died. Right. And Jesus is coming. He knows he's going to perform a miracle. And the way I love Jesus is that Jesus dealt with them as a total person. Right. When he came to see them, of course, they're crying and they're complaining and they're saying, you know, if you had not been here, my brother would have not died. Um, Jesus didn't rebuke them and be like, you ain't got no faith. And what's wrong with you? I'm about to raise him up. You see him crying and complaining. No, Jesus said, you know what? If you believe you're going to see the power of God. Right. And they get into into a discussion. Right. And then he walks into the tomb and she says, no, wait a minute, Lord. I don't want to relive the trauma of my, bri- my brother dying. He stinks. And then he says, well, did I not tell you? He walks her through the experience, right? He even cries with them, right? Knowing what he's going to do for them, he cries with them. He meets them in every experience until they see the full manifestation of the power of God being birthed in their depravity, the power of God being birthed in their trauma, right? And when we know how to walk with Jesus, we get a holistic perspective where you don't need a church room, ex- you don't need a Sunday morning or a sanctuary experience to experience power of peace. You can find him right in the midst of your trauma. And that's where God wants to get to. He wants us to come to a place of trauma. He's tired of us having prayers that we have not talked about our trauma. We praying about everything, but the thing that really hurts as if he's unaware of it, as if he doesn't see it. And his love is reaching to that area and he's waiting for you to learn how to open up. But the problem is by yourself, you don't know how to open up and that's fine. That's okay. He, there's people he raised up called counselors, right? With the wherewithal, with an anointing, how about that? <laughs> with technique that will discern and decide for your spirit to help you navigate through your trauma. And that's what Jesus wants us to meet. <laughs> oh, Ashley, you couldn't even have said that better. Praise God. <laughs> so interesting about what you're saying is that that is exactly what I rely on when I'm doing therapy right in the, if it's not but for the Holy Spirit, every single person that comes through my door, that finds me on psychology today, that gets a referral, I pray to my Lord and Savior every day because they have been, even for the non-believers, it's because he ordained them to come to me because there is something that I'm able to dispense in that therapeutic process I don't care if you don't believe in God. I bet you know what a believer looks like when you're coming into my session. And I don't even got to mention it. Because why? I rely on the resources of the Bible, the word, the truth. I rely on the Holy Ghost Spirit to give me discernment and wisdom to meet where that person, meet that person where they are in need. There is no such thing as dividing counseling in Jesus. He is the counselor. And if he calls counselors who are believers, then he is working through you. And that's just facts. That's just facts. You better say that. You, you had a little Kojic in your voice right there, sis. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I almost took a lap around this good table. Now, come on now, because y'all are 100% correct. I'm not even going to repeat it. Like everything y'all said is on point. So I guess my next question to you, and this is a question that came from the... Uh, that came from the group is, so do you think that every single pastor or church leader or really pastor needs to be a professional counselor um, in order to counsel their congregation? Or I'm going to add to this, are there trainings that we can give pastors so that they recognize what are some things that we can handle in church and what are some things that I might need to connect you to a counselor like Pastor Robinson, like Robin, like Brianna, where they can say, OK, maybe I need to refer you to someone because this is a little bigger. And I think there are things at play where 
just what we're doing here is not enough. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I would encourage every church to create a resource guide, and I'm even working on this myself. Um, one of my frat brothers here locally in the Philadelphia area um, who pastors a church, he created a resource guide, a community resource guide of various um, organizations in the community that people may need to access, um, not just retail, not just um, services like that, but services that deal with health issues and mental health issues to have those kinds of resource uh, uh, um, numbers and, and in, in a booklet that the church can have. Because one of the unique things about me as a pastor, I have a master's degree in Christian counseling. Most pastors that do have uh, degrees are um, masters in divinity or doctorates of divinity or doctorates of theology, um, where they have a deep rooted expertise in the scripture, but in terms of handling uh, other issues like mental or behavioral maladies, they may be inexperienced in that, in that regard. And it shouldn't be intimidating to them to want to offer a referral out, you know, because that's out of their scope. I can handle certain issues. Like I do not deal with, you know, issues outside of um, premarital counseling and marital counseling. When it comes to family counseling or other types of behavioral and mental uh, issues, I refer out to you know, colleagues of mine that have respective expertise. And so after I create this booklet that I would highly recommend that a church adopts as a project to create a booklet that has resource information that people can access, not just physically, but maybe have it available as an online resource that they can access, you know, privately um, at any time so that if I need help, I have this guide that the church provided on a variety of services, including mental health resources that I could take advantage of. And you spoke of something earlier, Matthew, about care cell groups. I forget the name that you, you refer to it as, but we call the care cell the way I was brought up. We're in small groups. It's in those small group formations that you can find out when people are really struggling. And that's the kind of information that can be you know, funneled up to the pastor so that if people feel uncomfortable helping that person, the pastor can then intervene and work with those individuals uh, to get them the help that they really need. Um, I think it's important to have a resource guide um, if you don't have the expertise, because I don't believe pastors have to be professional counselors, but I 100% believe pastors need to be resourceful. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with him 100 um, percent. Everyone is not called to, to sit in a space of counseling. It is a calling um, along with the technique and skills that it requires. I think it is important for every pastor to educate themselves as necessary um, because pastoring is more than preaching. Right. Um, and I think uh, especially with a new wave of generation of preachers that are coming up, everybody turning around being a pastor and starting a church. But that's another panel for another day. Um, but nonetheless, um, it takes you have to remember that you have people that are sitting in those pews and you have to navigate them. You are called by God to navigate them through things of life. Right. So it would behoove you to equip yourself um, with all you can to do that. But at the same token, we need to get out of this king modelship of pastors. You like times we have senior pastors and they take the sole responsibility of leading thousands of people to the cross. Unwise, right? Why would you do that? When you have the whole body of Christ, like Mr. Michael is saying, that are resources in the pews, right? You have people like Robin, you have people like Brianna who are skilled, people like Matthew, right? Who are skilled, who are called, or this is their day-to-day -day living, whom you can start bringing discipleship, right? This is going back to the things that drive the church. Discipleship, whom you can connect with, have the discipleship where they can take a deeper assessment and shift more into a deeper clinical technique because that's what's necessary, right? And so, 
I think the one of the words I would say earlier is awareness, right? We need to become back to self-awareness, not just of your issues, but also of your limitations, right? You can't take all of it. You're not supposed to take all of it. You, this is why we're here to help each other, right? And so I know my call and I'm going to stay in it, right? Um, and when it's not my call, I'm going to refer to someone who has the anointing and the oil to help you with that. So that way you can begin to have the God that you need. And so I think as pastors and as leaders, this is so important for us. We can't be so removed from the congregation anymore, right? We have to be in and amongst the sheep, in and amongst the congregation, and also realize we are also sheep, right? How about that? That's, there's a say, a say logo right there. We're also sheep. And some of us, we need, may need to go see some of them, well, probably not your members, but you may need to go see somebody else too, because you got trauma from all the people you're leading. All the people you're leading are traumatizing you. Right. And every day you stand behind the pulpit, you look and face at your traumas every day. You don't want to say it because it seems a spiritual, but it's the truth. Right. And you need to go sit down somewhere and let someone walk you through through a space of healing as well. So that you can go back to your church and, and say, you know what, y'all need some healing. And as a pastor and as a leader, it's so important because we all know the truth. The truth. Members ain't going to do nothing that their pastor ain't going to tell them to do. Right. So if your church got resources and your church has a healing ministry, then push it. Right. Tell the people you need to go see this ministry. Right. And over the pulpit, in the announcements, you as a pastor, you have the voice, you have the influence. So use that influence to help the people be healthy. Right. And tell you, no, you need to take yourself to counseling. I did, too. I, I had my little crazy moments, but I got myself together and you need to do the same. Right. And that's how we become a healthy church altogether. I love that, Ashley, because we have to like humanize our pastors and our leaders, their people, too. And like you said, there's a different type of call that they have that's very special. But um, I just hope, I just want to encourage our leaders and pastors um, that you guys don't have to have all the answers um, because like utilize your team um, because you guys have your own families too. And so taking care of your own mental health is really critical. And I love that you said that, Ashley. And even as members, we have to like look at our expectations of people <laughs> and realize that there are other people besides the pastor that he has placed or around us or that God has placed in our lives that may not be pastor, senior pastor, but it may be sister so-and-so that can see you that you have a relationship with that has the medicine that you need. And so I think that um, just everyone, just including the leadership, being um, aware of their own stuff and just allowing, you got to allow each other to, to heal some more. And I kind of want to, ask you guys this because we got a question in the chat and I think it goes along with uh, what you were saying Ashley and what you were saying Brianna in that do you think pastors are even aware of the hurt that they cause sometimes and I'm going to take that to church leaders in general pastors church leaders deacons are they aware of the hurt that they cause to others at times or do they think that that hurt is justified because it's the word of God. Well, that's what God says. So you need to get over it. And I think a part of that answer is if you haven't dealt with your own trauma, how are you going to teach people how to deal with their own? You know, is that old adage or adage? I don't really know how to pronounce that word, but it's all good. Grace. Um, hurt people hurt people. Right. And when you are hurt and you have been impacted, you will then hurt and impact other people. I just often think in the church, we put on a banner of or the cape of the word of God says this and this is what it is. And it sounds really religious, but it doesn't help build relationship. And so what are your thoughts about that? I think that's true. Um, I, I'm scared of a pastor that is communicating and is unaware of what his communication is doing in his congregation. Red flag. Like, like that's like five red flags. You, you should, as a communicator, you should be pulsing your people, right? And you should be so in tune with the spirit of God who is communicating through you that you can feel, you can feel it, right? You know, someone who does preach and stands before a congregation, I can feel even before I'm preaching when I, what I'm going to say is about to be extremely heavy. Right. And I know that is about to tap into very vulnerable areas of your spirit. You need to be in tune with that. Right. And so with that, I know sometimes the Holy Spirit has to tell me, OK, I'm going to you're going to push push in here a little bit. Here. OK, let up a little bit. Right. Um, because what you're doing is, is going deep into someone's heart and, and it's it's triggering. Right. It can cause pain. And so but I need to be in tune with that. 
right? And so, and that becomes a sensitivity to the spirit and a sensitivity to the people. And as a pastor, as a leader, you need to have that, right? And honestly, and not to give pastors a bad rap, but at the same token, we need to understand that when you've done this for so many years and over, and you've experienced so much hurt as a pastor, right? Because pastors experience hurt too, right? Pastors are being hurt by their members on a regular, a lot of times, right? Because members will go, they won't tell their pastor what's going on. And they get mad at the pastor for not telling the pastor that they didn't tell the pastor what was going on. And then their pastor is not hurt and he's carrying the hurt and not experiencing or giving a, a space for him to let his hurt go. And now your hurt is coming out in your sermon, right? Now you preaching about me and I preaching about Jesus, right? You preaching about my trauma and my pain or your trauma and pain, right? How many sermons have we heard about people? How many sermons have we heard? I won't say the words, but we say those ninjas will say that, right? You don't need those ninjas or you need to stand up and do what you need to be doing. You don't need to worry about people. You don't need to worry about this. Go and be who God called you to be. It's all about, that's the junk we hear all the time. And that's the stuff coming from a heart that has not been healed because it's been hurt by people, right? And that's not healthy. And so as a responsibility of the pastor, we need to be sensitive to the needs and where our people are. We need to be sensitive to the fact if we have hurt someone, then we need to say something about that, right? We are sheep too. Right. And as leader of God, we are we don't as a pastor, as a leader of the church, you are not you. you first of all, your judgment is higher. Hello. Welcome to that. Right. You have a higher judgment, higher responsibility, higher call. But we are not removed from having to say sorry. Right. We're the first ones to actually say sorry because we're the leaders. Right. Um, being a minister, it means a servant. Right. So you need to have your apron on. Right. And you need to have your humility in and have your pride now. Right. And begin to realize, you know what? I preached that, I did preach my last sermon and it was good, but that was probably a little hard, right? And own that, right? You know what? You know what? I, maybe I didn't come off with enough grace in the moment, right? You know, being able to own these aspects about either your preaching or your personality so that you realize that what you are doing may be traumatizing people. It may be hurtful people. And as your members come and tell you, having to listen to that, you know, there's times when members have to tell me, you know what, what you said was good, but that was real hard. Right. I've had to have members tell me I didn't feel any transparency from your sermon. Right. I don't know if you really can relate to me. Right. And why when I first heard it, I got an attitude. Right. And then the Holy Spirit was like, and there it is. Right. You know, who are you to get this attitude when they're telling you they, they're not feeling you? There's something not translating. Right. In the message. And I had to slow down and go pick it up. Right. And so I think as pastors, we need to start making ourselves so removed and so hiding behind our sacred desk, thus saith the Lord. Because sometimes God don't speak to me like my pastor do, right? Sometimes God speaks to me a little more tender, right? Then some, sometimes some of the sermons comes out. And so we have to make sure we are in tune with his spirit and in tune with our people. That is our place and our responsibility. And we got to be real careful about, as pastors, ignoring what we see among the congregation. Um, when Eli ignored and turned a blind eye, to his sons, Hopney and Phineas, running through the congregation, having sex with the women in the congregation. When he turned a blind eye to his sons doing that, um, his consequence was his sons were killed and, and he was killed. And so we got to be careful about ignoring the, the issues and concerns we see in the flock because we don't want to offend so-and-so because they're the biggest tither, or we don't want to offend so-and-so because we don't, we don't want to um, have them leave the church and go to some other congregation. Our jobs as pastor is to speak truth to power. And sometimes that's going to hurt some people's feelings. And sometimes people are going to walk away. Jesus spoke truth to power and love and people walked away. And Jesus even said, it, look, if you go to someone and you're giving them the word and you you minister to to them and they don't want to receive it, he says, kick the dust off your sandals and keep it moving. Everybody's not going to be ready to receive in love what the pastor has to say. But it is our job as pastors to be accountable, responsible for what we see to make sure that we have a healthy flock, to do what we can to edify the flock, to esteem the flock more highly than ourselves and not play favorites and not, you know, turn the blind eye to stuff because we're held accountable for that kind of nonsense. So one of the things that uh, Pastor Kirk says a lot 
is that the word of God is offensive. And so when he first said that, I didn't know how I felt about it. I was like, mm, I don't know. That's just, you know. But I, when you look up the word offensive, there are two definitions. One of them is causing someone to be deeply hurt. The other one is actively aggressive and attacking. When pastor says the word of God is offensive, it is actively aggressive because it attacks and pulls down strongholds. And it's never comfortable when a stronghold in your life gets pulled down because sometimes your stronghold is your way of life. It's your whole worldview. And when that comes crashing down, that hurts, right? That doesn't feel comfortable. And often you do have to go to therapy after church to put the pieces back together in a healthy way, right? But it doesn't mean that you should be using the Bible as an offensive weapon to other people and to shame people or to condemn people or to do anything else. Remember, words have power. If you don't know what words mean, you will use them in a power where your intent won't match your impact, right? And so you have to be very cognizant. When we say the word of God is offensive, it's because it breaks down strongholds. It breaks down things so that you can live a holy, godly life. Not that it is designed to injure people or it is designed to insult people. That is not what the word of God is there for. And so we are running, we are over time, um, but I hope everybody doesn't mind. There are just a couple things that I think are really important for us to talk about before this call ends. One of them is a question that's asked directly to what we just talked about. When you see the pastor saying things that might be offending the congregation or as church leaders, folks will come to us and say, you know, pastor said this and it made me feel like this. And you're recognizing that again, that intent didn't match the impact. And maybe it wasn't one of those, oh, you just want to live in sin and you just didn't like that. Maybe it really was pastor said something triggering today or pastor made this comment. As a church leader, how do you talk to your pastor about that? How do you bring that up? How do you say, hey, this is what we're hearing? How do you bring those things up? I mean, I think you see you see something, say something. You know, it's not, we don't, we does not mystify it um, for what it is. You, you need to have a conversation. Just as much as something was going on wrong with another member, pastors are members of a church, right? And so if there was something going wrong with another member, you will pull that member aside and you will have a conversation, right? And so same thing with your pastor, right? If there was something that he said, whether it was to you or even if something you heard through the grapevine, you need to talk to your pastor, right? And in and, and love, you don't come to any kind of way, you know, pastor, what you said, that, you know, just like how you want someone to talk to you, <laughs> you come like you want to have that conversation. You don't want to talk, come to him correct. Like you got some sense, right? Don't come at him left or your pastor's going to be on the defense because he's a person too, right? Um, and so, but you need to have the conversation, right? And with that, nobody is in a hierarchy where they are untouchable. And so, and, and unfortunately, and at times we make mistakes. Pastors make mistakes too. Sometimes, like you said, the word of God, I want to go um, back to what you said, Matthew. I think it's, it's a very important point to remember as well. That the word of God is alive and full of power, sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between soul and the spirit, bone and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of your heart. That is what the word is doing, right? It is that powerful, it is that potent, and it is that sharp, right? When I was in school, they said that that word sword also duels like as, as a scalpel. So while the preacher is preaching, it's doing surgery on you, right? And so the word is, is a trigger all by itself, Right. The word is a trigger or by itself. The word with a magnet will cause trials to be will, will cause. It's like a magnet that will bring trials into your life based upon the word. Right. And so this is what the preacher is carrying in his mouth. Right. And so first and foremost, because it's that strong, it doesn't need our extra thrust behind it. It can do the work by itself. Right. And so but two, as listeners, we have to remember that the word is going to break into areas in me that are going to touch things where I am traumatized. Right. So I think that for those who are listening, we need to digest that part. Right. I don't want us to, to, to skate past that because I think we need to digest that part. Right. You're going to listen to sermons that are going to break into intimate areas of your life that are going to un uh, that's going to uncover the trauma. Right. And when that happens, you need to see counseling. Right. You need to see that space. But at the same token, as preachers are preaching and they are maybe traumatizing you in the way that they're preaching um, because it can happen so many times. 
preachers who may be, even some, a lot of people just do it with their children. I can't tell you how many times I've heard uh, sh- stories about children over the pulpit or about family members and things like that, wanting to be transparent, but it becomes traumatizing. We need to say something, right? We need to have a conversation with them, schedule a meeting, right? And be honest and transparent. This, when I heard this, I heard the truth of what you said, but I feel like it could have been communicated a different way, right? And so, and have that honest conversation. And even as a leader and as a pastor, we have to be open to listen to that. Right. We can't, you know, just say, well, I was preaching and hide behind my work, my assignment, my responsibility or the sermon. Right. We have to examine the fact that how did I say it? Could I've said it a better way? Right. Could I've done it a better way? And I think also having church structure where you're not just a senior pastor, you don't have other elders to have conversation with you, because sometimes it may not take a member to tell you the other elders can come tell you. Right. I, I, I'm in a church where I'm not the only pastor. We have a lead pastor and I'm a pastor as well. And sometimes after my sermon, say, my other pastor will say, you know what, that was good what you said, but you could have said that a different way. Right. Or maybe you could have chosen a different way to communicate that. Right. And so and we challenge each other in that way, which is helpful. Right. And healthy because you keep an open atmosphere. Right. Once again, it's the atmosphere that's happening in the, in the head, which translate down to the body. Right. Of people being open and honest and communicating with each other about how to do something well. I love that, Ashley. I do just want to add to that, um, which is it's, it never ends well when you suppress things. So to Ashley's point, um, communicate. Communication is key. If the person doesn't know that you're offended or, you know, that he's hurt you or she's hurt you, then they, there, there can be no reconciliation or restoration. So I do think that, um, you know, even if you're nervous, pray about that on the approach, the timing, pulling them aside. If you need another believer to go with you, you know, try to do it on your own. But if you, if you don't feel safe enough or or confident enough, um, but I do agree with Ashley with, uh, you know, communicating the word does tell us as believers that if we have a problem with our brother or sister, like to go, and that's something that we're supposed to do. So, and and not putting people on a pedestal. I think that sometimes we can idolize people so much, or where we where we feel like they're untouchable, but at the same time they're human also. So I think that if we realize that it's God and then it's all of us, then that kind of helps us in our approach. Thank y'all so much. So we are going to. Begin to close things down a bit. Panelists, I'm going to ask you to multitask as we do this because I'm going to ask you to do a couple things at once so that we can be respectful of everybody's time, including yours. The first thing is Pastor Robinson has been doing a great job of putting resources in the chat. If all of you can put some resources in the chat while I'm asking this final question, I think it's good to talk about the resources, but I think if we put them in the chat, people can write them down and save them, copy and paste them. So if you could put some resources in the chat. Oh, and you know what? Also, though, people on Facebook don't have access to those resources that you're putting in the chat in here. So actually, I will ask you to say some of these resources out loud in addition to putting them in the chat. Remember, you're multitasking for me. So if you could do that, the other thing, and everybody doesn't need to talk about this, but one thing is I would love for us to just debunk really quick. What happens in therapy? What actually happens in a counseling session? And What are some of the things that if they're happening in my life, maybe I should go to counseling for? Because I think those are two things that people aren't really sure. When is the time to go to counseling? You know, is it a lot of times we think it's just um, suicide or it's just death and grieving. It could be a lot of both things and other things. So, again, you're multitasking. First thing you guys are doing is to talk about resources. Second thing you're going to do is talk a little bit about debunking what happens in a counseling session and what types of things uh, folks should be going to counseling for. In the chat, I I put the name of a really good friend of mine. Her name is Dr. Tina Scott. She's a licensed therapist, psychologist here in Philadelphia, very popular. And she has a vast network of African-American clinicians that are psychologists, psychiatrists, and licensed therapists. She has a broad network of people that she um, has a part of this this community that she has organized um, across the country. And I would highly recommend if anybody wants to touch base, just to, even if you're just curious about learning about what therapy entails and and, and what's that about, and you wanna keep it cultural within your own uh, culture, Dr. Tina Scott is someone I would highly recommend. And, and her contact information is in the chat. 
Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to just speak on what I put in the chat, uh, just identifying a therapist. We have the lovely Robin. I don't know if you're full or accepting clients right now, but um, if you are looking for a therapist, Psychology Today, yep, um, is a resource and therapy for Black girls. I do know, I don't want to forget about the men also. There are resources for men also on Instagram. They have pages. Um, Matthew, I'm sure you could probably share some um, from the male perspective, like some people you can follow on Instagram or on social media, maybe not. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, there's, I would definitely start there and then like, just think about what's important to you at your core and what you're looking for a therapist because finding the right fit is important. So look at what they specialize in, look at insurance, um, those type of things. Cause that can definitely, and your job also can be a resource with um, employee programs that can help. What I'd say, too, is when looking for a therapist, um, exactly what Brianna said, as far as looking at what they're saying their specialties are and some of their techniques and approaches, but at least get two to three, because finding the fit is so, so, so important. And I've heard a lot of uh, therapy hurt, too. Like people have gone to therapy for the first time and then they have this horrible experience and then they don't go back. And similar, because they're not sure what to expect, sometimes some of them sit in a therapeutic relationship way too long because they didn't know what to expect. And they feel like, well, maybe this was how it was supposed to go. So ideally in a therapeutic relationship, when you are, if you don't, if you go to therapy, not knowing what to expect, pay attention. If nothing else, you may be just down and out and depressed and feeling stagnant about your life. And you just need someone to sort out all the different thoughts that are muddled in your head to have someone and have a space for an hour, 50 minutes as it should be before an hour to just kind of sort things out where, you know, you're not going to be judged or criticized for how you think and for what you need to process. It doesn't have to be make sense. It doesn't have to be linear. You need to have someone that when you walk into that room, the atmosphere, we're going back to atmosphere because the atmosphere is what that person is bringing to the therapeutic relationship. And if you don't feel comfortable and connected, you're not going to want to talk. So like really paying attention to your own energy, to the energy of the therapist, to how you feel. Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel like it's an authentic person? Um, because you're, they're going to model a mirror, a, 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 a space for you to build your confidence and be encouraged to want to work on the things that um, you're coming in there to talk about and discuss. And it doesn't, like Matthew said, it doesn't have to be that you have to be suicidal or depressed. It could be work-related. It could be that you just had a baby. It could be that you just, um, you know, you're going through a divorce or you're in a new relationship and you feel like you're being triggered in ways that you never identified before. When you can't identify certain things, you go into your home girl and your home boy, and you go, and you're like, their advice ain't working no more. That's when you know, you're like, wait a minute, I need to talk to a stranger potentially who can give me a totally different perspective with no biases. Um, so speaking to what I put in the resource, and this was going back to the leadership, there's a mental health first aid training that leaderships can take. It doesn't mean that you have to be licensed therapist at all or a, a clinical person, but it's a training that you can just get exposed to certain signs and certain behaviors and know what to look for. Just like if you're going to administer, you know, like a CBR kind of training, but it, it speaks specific to mental health and they have it for youth and they have it for adults. Um, my therapist is connected to lifechristiancounseling.com. Uh, that's where you can um, go to find a counseling, lifechristiancounseling.com. That's the therapist um, who I currently see. And my experience of attending, um, being on the other side, um, has been wonderful. Like, it's been a lot of what Robin is saying. It's been a conversation. Um, and I appreciate that. It's nothing, as you said, Matthew, debunking or demystifying this experience. Are you laying on the couch and, you know, the lights are dim and, you know, music is playing in the background and then they hypnotize you and you have a whole get out experience. No, it's not been anything like that. Um, it really has just been a conversation. And, and it's wonderful for me because I process a lot, a lot of things through talking. So like, it's wonderful just to have, it was even more helpful having someone who was not in my circle, who I don't normally talk to every day, who have the bias of the way Ashley thinks already and can, can see me objectively and help me wade between the, wade between the thoughts um, and get such an external um, a point of view 
of, of my own processing and advice, right? About what it means for me to change my mental map um, and change my own script in my life. So it's been wonderful. It's been a great conversation. And it's a space that we all need to go to, especially, can I put this plug in for black men? Um, we need to learn how to have the conversation, right? Um, black men, we are suffering because we're so quiet. Um, but we need to talk. Um, and, who, and what better to do for a black man to talk to someone who don't know you and don't know anyone in your circle. <laughs> so um, that's a safe place, right? And so, and like Robin said, making sure that you, you and that person have a good connection, um, that's important, but having that safe space, as black men, we need to talk. Um, and when we do that, we'll be better husbands and fathers and sons and, and boyfriends or whatever the case may be, whatever roles we feel, we will be better in those spaces. So that's what I've done and that resource is available. I do want to plug Stephen's ministry. We do have that at Sharon Bible Fellowship Church. So if you're interested, um, then you can reach out. We've done plenty of announcements, and it's a great ministry for those who... Explain what Stephen ministry is. <laughs> okay, so Stephen's ministry is Christian care. Um, basically, it is a confidential ministry um, where people are assigned to work with someone if they're going through all the things we just said as far as like loss or any type of transition and adjustment um, in life. And so we are connected to resources in the community where if it's not in our expertise, you can outsource, but it is another type of Christian care counseling. So our final question for everybody tonight as we close out, if there is one thing you want everybody to walk away with from this conversation that we had tonight, what would that one thing be? Jesus and counseling are one. Amen. Ditto. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Well, I, I don't disagree with that at all. And um, I just, again, want, on behalf of Sharon Bible Fellowship Church, thank you guys so, 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 so much for agreeing to do this panel. Thank you for everybody who is listening in on the Zoom and on Facebook. I, I don't even think I can begin to explain how helpful I truly believe this conversation was. And I'll be very honest, as I have been sitting here, I have gotten text messages and not from, not even from church members, from friends of mine, people that saw the, um, saw the advertisement on Instagram or on Facebook and tuned in and them saying how much they appreciated the conversation we had tonight, how much they appreciated validation that they might have gotten from this, um, how much people appreciate understanding and recognizing that church hurt is real and just having the conversation about mental health in the church. And so I, I really do believe that this was such an important topic and I think there are ways that we can continue this discussion, not just in panels like this, but as Pastor Robinson was saying, in doing the work, building that resource guide, doing all of these things. You know, I, I think there's so much that more that we can do to continue to develop the people of God to be the people of God that he created them to be. When the Bible says that Jesus came to give us life and that which more abundantly, you living in bondage is not the abundant life that God had designed for you. And so as was said multiple times on this panel, Jesus loves you enough. Let me tell y'all something. Jesus loves you enough that in his forethought, he created somebody that had just what you needed to be free from everything that you have gone through. That is how much God loves you, that he created another person just to free you from the things that are binding you. And how does he know that that person is going to free you? Because he put the Holy Spirit in that person. The same spirit that lives in you lives in them. And they talk to each other 
so that you get the freedom and the deliverance that you need. That is the God that we serve. That is why Jesus and therapy have to be together because the same spirit lives in each of us. So thank y'all so much for coming tonight. We're going to close out in prayer. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Robinson if you would close us out in prayer. Um, and then after he closes us out in prayer, I'm going to say good night to everybody right now because we're going to click that cute little leave in the right bottom right hand corner <laughs> of your Zoom. Good night, everyone, in advance. Thank you so much Bye in advance, y'all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the exchange and the dialogue tonight. We thank you, Lord, for those that were engaged, for the 50 plus in the audience, Lord, that participated in uh, this, this great discussion tonight. Lord, it is my prayer, Lord, that you would bless and expand the work and the ministry of Brianna and Robin and Ashley and Matthew. And we thank you, God, for laying the vision of this um, dialogue, this panel discussion on the heart of Pastor Victor Kirk. And so God continue, Lord, to uplift the people that are psychologists and clinicians and psychiatrists and social workers that do the work, Lord, that you've empowered them to do and you've equipped them to do, Lord, and the pastors and ministers and, and, and the teachers, those that you've gifted to the body of Christ, Lord, to help make us whole when we're broken. And God, I pray right now that you would just saturate each and every soul that participated in this session tonight night. Saturate them right now, Lord, with your presence. Saturate their mind. Help transform their thinking, God. Lord, give them, Lord, the, the courage, Lord, to seek the help, Lord, the wisdom to reach out and tap into the resources, Lord, that you've set up, whether it's people and places and things that can help them, Lord, overcome any malady or mental challenges or behavioral issues, Lord, or any addictive issues that they're challenged with in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you so much for our moderator tonight, Lord. And God, we just give you praise. We give you honor for just laying on the heart of God's people, such progressive ministry like this, God. And God, we thank you and we give you advanced praise for the deliverance, Lord, that you're going to do in the lives of these, your people. So bless your name, Lord. And we thank you for the end in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank amen. you, everybody, again, for coming out tonight. Good night. Good, good night, night, everybody. everybody. Thank you to our same. panelists. Love, peace, blessings, hair grease, Crisco, whatever it is that you need. <laughs>